Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this uh, new episode of Half Samvad under the Kalinga Lit Fest. And today I have with me two Bengalis, extremely talented, extremely erudite, and not staying in Bengal. We have with us Koral Das Gupta, as well as Saikat Majundar. Hi, Koral. Hi, Saikat, and welcome to this session. And thank you for having us. And uh, without much ado, today we will be discussing. Uh, of course, Coral's book, uh, Kunti. Uh, I have it with me here. Hopefully, the Coral, you have a copy with you, which you can show. So we'll be discussing this book. And of course, we will also be discussing much more beyond this book and look at female characters and, of course, Saikat's uh, beautiful book, Fireflies. So, Firebird. uh, Firebirds, I'm sorry. So let's start off first with uh, Koral uh, Kunti. Why Kunti? How did this book come about? And uh, of all the characters in the Mahabharata, I know you are going to be writing about the others. So how do, how come you started with Kunti? Uh, Rishabh, so uh, this is a part of the Panchkanya series that I am doing. So Panchkanya is Ahalya, Kunti, Draupadi, Mandodari, and Tara. So Ahalya was out last year. We are doing this five book series and uh, Kunti is the second book of the series. So um, after Ahalya, I had to choose uh, one of the other four and uh, I wanted to go chronologically the way their names have appeared uh, in the slokas. I didn't want to uh, choose my order. I wanted to go with their order and figure. So that's how Kunti. Fantastic. Hmm. So, Saikud, uh, you, I mean, we were chatting and you said you had some uh, questions for Koral. Would you like to go first? Yeah, I, mean, I was uh, thinking along the same lines as you, Rishabh. So, I think you really put us on the right track. So, thank you for that. Uh, see, retellings are really fascinating. I mean, this is something we talk a lot about in literature, literature classrooms. When you take a classical story, typically these are stories from religious texts, whether it's the Bible or the epics, or for that matter, Shakespeare. And then a modern writer decides to retell it in a kind of a their own way. And it obviously has its risks and challenges. Everybody knows what the story is. And, um, you know, there's a lot of aspects to it, but one key aspect to retelling has often been politics. That is, often people want to pick up a character who is pushed to the margins, who is sort of seen as not important or were not given their due. And the impulse is often to tell the story from their perspective, right? I mean, what would the story look like if this person told the story? So we've had, you know, obviously Caliban telling the story of Tempest, you know, things like, you know, slaves retelling stories of, you know, other colonial, whatever. So it's a kind of a new perspective. And I can almost see Corals. I mean, that was my first question to her, that obviously this Panchkanya series, The Five Women, um, you know, obviously we can see the strong feminist impulse at work here. So would you, would, would you say something about the political impulse behind choosing these five characters and how they're working out so far? Uh, so, Shaikat, firstly, thanks for joining us uh, for discussing Kunti. Uh, now, uh, this particular question, it's, I didn't choose these characters to talk about, I mean, to, to talk about specifically their politics, you know. I just chose because I found these characters very fascinating. And uh, when I write, I seldom have any idea about what I'll write. Uh, mm -hmm. Usually, when I write the book, progresses, I don't have a character graph or a plot graph. So initially, I didn't have anything specific in mind. But as the story progressed, you have read both Ahalya and Kunti. And you would probably know that how uh, intricately the mm -hmm. politics and the uh, feminine, uh, I mean, it, the feminine kitchen to the feminine bedroom to the feminine workplace, mm -hmm. all of the, those have impacted uh, the storytelling and uh, politics did end up playing a very strong role so uh, in in general i once used to think or i still say that i'm a very apolitical person and it actually told me that 
probably I am not an apolitical person and nobody can be. It's either that I restrain from talking much about it or I tend to engage myself less into the kind of things that I'm not very comfortable about because it will drag me into a space that I don't want to get in. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to these, uh, these women and their aspect of storytelling, I find that uh, a lot of things have changed. A lot of things we are talking about from a different perspective. But a lot of things have also remained the same. And mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to Hindu philosophical writing, Shaikot, I have engaged a lot more than probably many others who are contemporary to me. And I figured that many have often opined that uh, Hindu philosophical literature is very regressive towards women. And I found that uh, those literature are not at all regressive. They have just told the stories from a particular perspective and left it to the reader to interpret the way they want to. Just because they have a religious connotation, they didn't come with a bullet set of morals. So the way you read the story and what you interpret becomes your politics and not the politics necessarily of the writer who had gone, I mean, you know, uh, consumed it, uh, who had written it. So when these stories traveled through various eras or era of patriarchy, they got told in a particular way. When I was more small, I was told that Ahalya cheated and hence she got cursed into a stone and she got turned into a stone, giving me the idea that if you do something which is not uh, accepted by, by general, by people, or by a particular uh, form of power, then there are consequences to this. There are consequences to everything. And mythology shows that there is no bigger uh, evidence than mythology of any culture, which shows that everything has consequence. But women's stories have followed certain directions. So definitely when we go back to these stories, we find that there are so many lost opportunities where clues have been left and they have not been picked up because uh, they were not meant to be picked up when those stories were told by certain mouths who wanted to uh, limit themselves into the kind of morals that they wanted to share. From there, looking at these stories and uh, retelling those stories, some kind of uh, reinventing these characters and the stories had been very liberating for me. But I do believe that there's no end to it. Sometime after, maybe someone else will write and they will do a far better job than anything. No, I absolutely agree. I mean, I think um, to live without politics is a lot like to breathe without lungs. You know, obviously nobody's apolitical. The problem is we tend to define politics in a narrow way. We think politics right. is in the parliament and the voting and the elections. But of course, politics is there in the bedroom, the kitchen, the neighborhood chai shop. I mean, there's, there's politics. Wherever there are human beings, there's politics. Politics is basically human relationship, right? That is, an, and whenever there's a play of power and, you know, you know very well that I'm more interested in the politics of the neighborhood tea shop and the bedroom than the politics of of elections. So absolutely, I meant political in the in a larger sense, in a sense of women's position. And uh, I'm also very interested in how this politics gets reflected in form, not just politics as something that happens outside the beauty of a text or outside a structure of a sentence, but how politics changes the structure of a sentence, how politics changes how a metaphor or a simile looks like. So it's, there's no inner outer division. The outer is the inner and the inner is the outer. And while reading this book, I mean, or rereading it because I've read it a couple of times now, I read it first in manuscript and then I read it up a couple of times now in print. So it's every time I found new things about it, you know, I was very struck by the voice. I was very struck by Kunti's voice. Um, obviously the first thing that stands out, it's a first person narration here. Kunti is telling her story, which is obviously very different. I mean, that's the first thing about retellings is you give somebody a voice, right? You know, Kunti didn't have a voice as such. We could see her actions, but we never saw 
what she was thinking, what she was doing. And this is this this is I think what what is really striking is you've pulled up the strange and I I remember this from Ahalya too. There's a strange sense of vulnerability and strength playing against each other. There's a the vulnerability, there's the emotional tension, and yet there are unexpected moments of strength. So I I, I wanted you to talk a little bit about what you thought about the voice. I mean, particularly a couple of things really stand out to me. One is I was thinking of the moment of intimacy with Surya, where she is intimate with Surya and obviously, and there's this real sense of passion. And then later on, towards the end of the book, obviously, we have the scene of intimacy with Indra. And um, I don't know if this might be just my reading, but when Kunti was talking about her intimacy with Indra, it felt to me a lot more conceptual and strategic, whereas the intimacy with Surya felt much more spontaneous, you know, much, much more natural. And I think that's very interesting because before that, obviously, you know, uh, she has certain expectations, whereas um, with Surya, it seems more natural. Obviously, she was unmarried. So in a way, that intimacy shouldn't even have happened. There's this illicit thing about it. And of course, the other big thing which runs throughout your novel is the sons that come out of it. So Karna obviously has a very different place. So I mean, I'm, 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 I just, I just put too many things on your plate. So I'll just shut up. But I wanted you to talk a little bit about the voice, about Kunti's voice. Um, you can bring in Ahalya too, because I think the, the, the both the books are kind of united in this strange balance of strength and vulnerability in the way they speak. Uh, and if you could say a little bit about the moments of intimacy that Kunti experiences. Uh, so, Shirkat, uh, when I was writing these, when I started writing these, uh, one of the things that came to me naturally was to, you know, basically sit down and feel that what these people must have, I mean, what would happen if I am supposed to go through this? Uh, and I could see that, uh, especially with Kunti, more uh, for Kunti than for Ahalya, because it's very natural, it's very easy to love a person like Ahalya, Ahalya because uh, she had been wrong. And everybody knows that she had been wrong. But for Kunti, it is far more grave compared mm -hmm. to uh, anybody else. And moreover, Kunti is a mother figure, and you expect mothers to be absolutely perfect taking the right decisions, doing the right things, staying within certain boundaries. So actually, I thought that this would be quite a litmus test that uh, Ahalya people had really uh, uh, loved the kind of uh, wings that the lady had got. And I thought that it would be quite a litmus test to see that whether they really mean that they enjoyed or appreciate those wings. Because can you appreciate the mother like that? A mother who had uh, discarded her son, how would you would you appreciate that? So coming to your question, basically, uh, the voice was some kind of that. There are times where, I mean, uh, the voice was very dominating. I mean, uh, a woman of Kunti's stature who was just married, with all her heart, rejecting the voice of uh, Bhishma was not an easy thing to do. But in most of the traditional houses, that is what women go through, right? I mean, I have so many examples from my family and from others where a newly married woman have had to negotiate. For some time, she has tried to you know, understand or look for the nice things in the family and kind of be happy with that. And there has also been times when she didn't want to hide the fact that I don't like the way he has spoken to me. I don't like the way she is imposing things to me. And then a very few minuscule actually talk and say that uh, this is not acceptable. Hmm. This still this still holds. So for Kunti, there were so many, uh, for a person like Kunti, so many tried to contain her. Durvasa hmm. tried. And all of them were actually discovering her. All of them were trying, they wanted to see Kunti in a way that is no different from anybody else. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, you know, one of the five that you see walking on the playground. And they couldn't put her into that box, which made them 
look up and take notice. So those things were important to me in the sense that one person who is confident enough to say that this is not the child that I wanted would have uh, would have a brain of steel and nerves of steel uh, because it's not easy for mothers. They, uh, they are far more attached to their children. But then taking that practical decision and staying uh, attached to, the, to that goal, if I may use that word, to that goal, which she had found for herself. And her goal was enormous. You very rightly pointed out that her intimacy with Surya was far more spontaneous because it was spontaneous. She didn't plan it. But if you see uh, her intimacy with uh, Indra, she had planned it all her life. Mm -hmm. She she was ambitious to the extent that she, being a princess from Earth, wanted children from the king of the heavens. She was that level ambitious, that huge was her goal. And she never believed that this goal may not work. She always believed that it will. It will everything has its time, it will work. Now, coming to Mother Kunti, every mother is extremely ambitious about their children. And that children, that motherhood, doesn't necessarily have to be biological only. I mean, you know, Shrikat, when you write your books, you are a mother to your books. Uh, Rishabh runs an entity, and he is a mother to that entity. So motherhood is, is an attitude that is very, born very much inside. and it doesn't necessarily have to be restricted only to the biological aspect of it. There is a huge mental aspect of it. I always, uh, I'm never, I never hide the fact that my husband became a father much before I became a mother to our son. He, uh, ha I mean, he uh, was already into it and I took some months after my child was born. So motherhood is a very, diff very much vaster uh, construct. So, uh, and everybody is very, very ambitious about their children. They want their child to be the biggest and the best. And Kunti was planning, Kunti always had a look for the future. And her motherhood stems from there. She wanted to be the mother of the biggest warrior of her times. And she made sure that uh, it happened to her so much uh, did she want it that it actually happened to her. So when it comes to the intimacies, obviously, if you see Ahalya, Ahalya was very much into the beauty that Indra was. She could see the, the in nature, in colors, in the waves of the river Mandakini and the uh, Parijat Plaza. She could see Indra. She none of them. She actually didn't see Indra, but she could feel Indra. She could experience how big and how beautiful was Indra. In Kunti. There is no description of Kunti. There is no description of Indra either. It doesn't matter. It didn't matter how they looked like. Kunti was totally into the designation of Indra. She wanted the child of the king of heavens. So with Surya, it was far more spontaneous, as you said. And with Indra, it was there was a reason why she was going and why she had chosen Indra as her partner. It was right. not I think just. Yeah, it was not just passionate yeah. lovemaking. Yeah, absolutely. I think the part where they say that Indra is a concept, not just a position. So I think this uh, actually comes to you know the very important question Rishabh raised at the beginning that why Kunti? So I think uh, I don't know if um, Rishabh, uh, you want to rephrase that question after what Coral said, or do you feel like you want to jump in here or say something, or because that's, that's the very, that's the so. first question which I think comes. Ooh. Yeah. No, I think it's very interesting. I think uh, when when the uh, you know I am reminded of uh, this quote, which and when we were talking about uh, fleshing out characters, this quote that says that uh, until the lion learns how to write, every story mm -hmm. will glorify the hunter. So I think you just, need yeah. someone to come jump in and say that it's not just those one one of those five people walking on the streets. Every person, mm -hmm. every personality. Whether it's a princess mm -hmm. or someone on the street who has a story which is worth retelling. It depends mm -hmm. on the perspective that we have. 
Hmm. And uh, uh, and Kodal also mentioned something about uh, the fact that uh, we look at a certain times with a certain sense of patriarchy or the fact that hmm. our lenses are colored in terms of the fact that uh, are the, is this progressive or not. But I think for most stories, they just hmm. reflect the times. Because mm-hmm. even our understanding of what is being progressive may also keep evolving. What would be acceptable or required, say, at a certain era of time, would be mm-hmm. very, very different from today. So a lot of times we are looking at a different era or a different time with the different lenses, which is why my next question to uh, both of you would be, uh, Saikat, you've written this very popular book uh, about a mother and son. And, and of course, there is this dynamics happening between them. There is where the son is almost reconstructing the mother in his mind through various inputs. And how do, when we look at over a span of time, of course, there are these obvious glaring differences which you can see in terms of how women are. But in some sense, I mean, if you look at the way Koral was explaining uh, Kunti right now, it could be a very, very 19... 90s modern story of a political family where the father is no longer there and I mean you know and and the mother is uh, I mean we've seen movies we've seen stories weaved around similar concepts so what has really changed I mean in that sense it's 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 same human emotions same human emotions playing around so how do you look at a modern Kunti and how do you relate uh, the, the overall uh, transition that we are seeing over the ages about the role of women in our society, the Kunti and the contemporary, what is it today? Well, that's a great question, but an enormously difficult question. And we could probably devote an entire literary festival to this question and still not <laughs> say anything meaningful because it's so huge. Um, the only thing I'll say, I mean, I think, um, you know, in a way, I mean, there's so many things which connects the book Coral written with couple of things I've touched on is um, is what a thin line there is between love and hate. You know, uh, how easily love becomes hate. Uh, and love between intimate family members. Family is, that's why family is the unit of Mahabharata and family is something that has drawn me. I haven't really dealt with the religious myth, but I've written about family uh, significantly. And this book, uh, Coral and you mentioned is about a mother-son relationship and it's so hard it's so easy to hate hate family members right because family members are impossible you just can't live with them you can't live without them you know that is the, that is the reality it's just um, and i think if you think of the mother-son relationship they're all family relationships are complicated but the mother-son relationship is enormously complicated i mean even within western history you go back to oedipus and that is kind of the one of the primal myths that Oedipus um, married his mother unknowingly and therefore the whole Oedipus complex and the whole desire and from their Hamlet or sons and lovers or, you know, in, in the case of in, in my novel, The Firebird, the whole idea that this boy watching his mother on theater, on stage and almost desiring her and kind of missing her and getting angry and how to deal with that. And the same thing I see in the Mahabharata in what you know, Coral obviously doesn't talk about the war so much, but this, what is the Mahabharata? What is the battle of Kurukhetra? Kurukhetra is about battle within families. It's about fighting family, right? And that is the inescapable reality. We are sometimes at our bitterest fights with our own. Our fights are not with our enemies. Our fights are with our own. And and something I've always believed, I think people might find this a little controversial, that war is a kind of an intimacy you are locked you know which is why sometimes when it comes to literary history you say that if you find yourself really hating a writer or a filmmaker or a musician in a way you're actually obsessed with that you know so you know dislike is a form of engagement so it's like you know why war is a kind of intimacy and i think this is obviously that comes up in the great moment of the gita when arjun is like What am I to do with this? And Krishna's entire attempt is, you know, this is what you do. And this is the same reason why, you know, you know, teenagers hit their parents or whatever, or 
siblings hate each other and of course there's a lot of violence and serious consequences you know property this and all that comes out of it and if you come from the indian i tell my students that don't have to look anywhere okay you're 18 19 or old so you may not have a lot of life experience just write about your family that's enough material for an entire lifetime you know the indian families are epics you don't need to go anywhere you don't need to step out on the streets your stories are right here right here in your bedroom right here in your you know and that is i think the theme that unites I and mean, there's so many things that unites you know the classical and the modern i mean classical in some ways but this is one great theme that i think this is what i think makes us indian writers you know even though we write in english that of coral is writing about these mythical figures and i'm not writing about mythical figures but i keep repeatedly go back to the family i go back to family and if it's a dysfunctional family is it a relationship between family or whether it's in in another book of mine an alternate kind of family whether heterosexual relationships sort of fall fall away and different kind of attachments come in it's all about attachment and family so i think that is something which really really connects and um i just wanted to i mean i had a question for coral around that is that i mean what i what really struck me was this this whole relationship in this novel with men surya and indra but this is whole other spa- space where she's talking with women so two things really stood out one was her encounter with gandhari and that's another very interesting moment where she's entering the family space and the encounter between kunti and gandhari the kind of a tension there right because they're in some ways rivals and of course we know they will become bigger rivals later but what is even more fascinating is when kunti sees madri so there's this part where she's gone and she's seeing madri this princess full of life and then she says and this sentence really stood out to me i have quoted this to coral before madri was just the portion pandu was thirsty for and this is a fascinating line i mean your husband is essentially important you have no sexual relationship with him he's essentially a husband only by name and you have your whole things planned out how you want to have children and then you see this woman and of course i imagine this was not uncommon in 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 a sort of all the times with royalty that you bring a different you know your husband has multiple wives but then when madri comes in it's quite fascinating how kunti deals with that it's a matter of strategy so i was i was wondering coral if you could say a little bit about you know you know taking rishab's question uh, sort of forward this whole relationship these things that play around and this i think is a matter in which the older and the modern times differ because obviously today the idea of polygamy or for that matter polyandry would be very difficult and that is one important way these families differ but kunti's attitude towards madri in this book for me was really fascinating okay uh, i will you know begin this question by answering you and i will end this answer by questioning both of you so uh, <laughs> to to begin with you know uh, shaita i have always felt and that is real um, experience that women are naturally very manipulative and that is not because we are negative people that is because we need to get a lot of things done without raising the ruckus about it uh, you know we have a whole number of people to put into the circle where everybody will have some opinion or the other and uh, you know uh, often in families the, the family thing that you were talking about in traditional families a man's voice and a woman's voice is very different so i have seen uh, in my family which was uh, traditional and big uh, <clears throat> the joint families during my childhood that i have uh, been fortunate to be a part of and also in others i have seen that in order to get a simple thing done men women often talk in a very different way and that rubs on in every every kind of thing i mean uh, we are often told that uh, the child listens only to you it's not that the child listens only to us every the child will listen to everybody if uh, the person can't talk in the right way we know how to talk to the child because we will not uh, sometimes we will say do it sometimes we will say i'll give you a candy and sometimes we will say that uh, some rakshas will come and sometimes we will say that i am really tired really please do it so there are four ways we know how to do it and uh, there are also of course uh, uh, 
traditionally the men folk would just say that do it otherwise ek thappa lagao so you know uh, we we are we have been into that space since long now uh, when it comes to women to women relationships and especially in the past in the traditional family setup where women were uh, i wouldn't call them second class second uh, class citizens because they were very powerful but they were not they didn't have the outer world to deal with they had only the inner world to deal with so when there is an outer world to deal with there was a very strict division of labor the way i see in stories of mahabharata and stories of those times any kind of uh, mythology or history for that matter so men who were dealing with the outer world had wars they were fighting with the sword and the bows now don't think that women who were trapped in the inner world didn't have wars they were fighting with the hatha and kunti but they were fighting so their wars were much different because men's wars could kill women's wars could kill only metaphorically they couldn't murder their family members so uh, from that perspective women were far more political than a man in the throne so there is a term which is very uh, common and we all know that is called kitchen politics it didn't come from nowhere right it came from a very strong uh, practice that was uh, evident and that was uh, experienced in the kitchen uh, i remember i mean i will contemporize it a little i remember that film it was a comedy the man had two wives and uh, when he comes back at the end of the day after work both the wives had prepared thalis for him and the both the wives were sitting in front of him when the man actually sits down to eat both the wives start fighting this one says pehle chawal khao this one says pehle roti khao chawal khao roti khao chawal khao roti khao the man leaves the food and goes away so don't think that politics is only men's job we are really good at it uh, so from that perspective when kunti meets gandhari obviously there will be a and while writing sati series one thing that my publisher has told me very strictly is that your books have to remember the past and reflect upon the future so whoever is reading must have a glimpse of the future and also of the past so you will find a little bit of ahalya in kunti and also a little bit of draupadi in uh, kunti uh, when uh, draupadi comes up it become it became a little bit easier for me because kunti has to be a part of uh, draupadi but uh, that is uh, what you were saying that you get to see what the kind of stuff that is building up between kunti and drop uh, kunti and gandhari because there is a future there between kunti and madhuri you know madhuri's portion i really didn't need to write i could have omitted it but i enjoy doing that part so much when you were pandu was not the husband that kunti was emotionally attached to so when you are not emotionally attached to something and you still have it it becomes a baggage right which you want to shed but you can't so when you can't shed that baggage you would always want to look for a different wife i mean different house you know shaadiyon mein cheeze milti hai pasand nahi aaya to kisi aur ko de dete hain that is a common practice among many houses i have seen that many of which i have also received i received with name tag that wo kisi aur ke liye hai jo diya gaya hai mere ko pass on hua hai that's why i know it you are talking so, about men i hope or husbands i'm assuming or <laughs> both the husband wife dono ne diya tha so i am assuming that it was a joint decision i will definitely not say it was the women's decision come on you are not getting me there so you mean the husbands were passed on to other people or wives were passed on <laughs> Me, right? I I would love to have a real life experience of that, and I would write another epic on that. But unfortunately, <laughs> nobody uh, came out that uh, clean. Uh, but in Kunti, obviously, Pandu was someone who was there as a compulsory additional that you professors teach at times, compulsory additional papers. So for 
Pandu, uh, for, for Kunti, Pandu was that compulsory original paper which she would have to write. So she just found a proxy who would go and write that paper and write well. And Madhuri did just the job that, uh, job for her, I think. Uh, seriously speaking, uh, when the husband, like Mad Pandu, goes for another wife, like Madhuri, and the world knows that Pandu and Madhuri did have a very, very beautiful relationship. And uh, there is also a, a, a reference that Madhuri didn't want to continue with her life when Pandu died. So this particular portion, I wanted to build up in a way that everything that you have is not something that you need to possess. We sometimes lose that balance. We sometimes, you know, this is mine becomes so important to us that we don't know when to disown. It's not of any use to us. That was something that came out. And because Kunti could uh, let go of Pandu and yet be such a beautiful friend to Pandu was because why the relationship blossomed, actually. A lot of things happened in her life because uh, she tried to put together, she tried to thread, though she didn't want, she didn't discard. She tried to thread things together and then say that this is not for me, but there is a way in which I can make life meaningful for everybody. That I found was, uh, I mean, that I uh, felt was very fascinating to be put forward in that way. Uh, I would like to have a, ask a question to both of you. Uh, and uh, Shoykat as an author, Rishabh as, uh, as a social participant, as, uh, as an entrepreneur also. You know, I, in Kunti, I found the struggles of any working mother. Uh, because uh, when Kunti discarded Karna and went away, I felt that the pain that she had felt could be equivalenced in some way to the mother who is leaving the child at home and going out for work. I found the same in Firebird, where, and I'll tell you why. Karna, after that, went through a series of people and he grew up with some kind of anger towards the mother who had discarded him. Now, the first thing that came to my mind was that Karna was get, being brought up very well by his foster parents. They really loved him. They wanted a child and that is how they got Karna. So why did Karna even need to know that he was not the real child of his foster parents? Why did he need to know? because he was told by the society, right? That is something that I found in Firebird Shaker, that when the mother was away, in her world, whatever be the world, that was her work. Theater was her work. Whatever way the society perceived theater to be like, theater was her work. It was her professional space. But when a mother went out for her professional uh, fulfillment, the child was experienced a whole a hell of a lot of things. Uh, and he, in that tender age was trying to process those and that created a lot of complications uh, this world this part of Choykot's world i know so i could put the question very specifically rishab i would like to know from you uh, your part of the story in the way that how do you perceive what is i mean how did you perceive about this as a participant and also as an observer so if i can hear about that so so coral uh... I mean, I can, of course, always excuse myself out of this, but this is not my job to do in this conversation. But uh, see, the thing is, uh, I think we are products of the conditioning that we have. The way I look at it is, uh, Saikat mentioned something very interesting uh, a few moments back, which was that uh, when he equated love and hatred as a very thin line. And then he said that even war is, uh, you know, uh, our war two situations i would like to take that one step forward which is that that war that we experience with someone else is also the war of our creation because we envisage a situation to be in a certain way 
and when it doesn't happen we are unhappy we are disturbed and there is the war so i think when you talk about this working mother concept or uh, this whole idea of uh, the past where why uh, karna felt uh, unhappy about the fact that uh, or why he felt uh, so distraught about the fact that his mother left or you put it in a very modern context it's all about conditioning if for example you live in a society where every day people go and uh, drop their kids to uh, school and go to work and then on their way back pick up and come back it's absolutely normal so when you are conditioned to imagine that when i go come back from school the mother is there waiting for me with my hot food and what not that's a conditioning so it's a question of what ecosystem you are really a part of i'm sure in in i mean we hear stories of uh, fathers who are uh, at home parents it it's it's not as common but tomorrow if you imagine that child who has been brought up with that in that ecosystem would find it absolutely normal or natural to do that something like that for himself or herself even within our cultures see i am i, I live in india my i have one sister who stays in the united states and and uh, the kind of lifestyle we have the kind of expectations we have from women for i mean i, I cannot imagine i have not done it i mean and i i i plead will be about it that if if uh, that after dinner i will go up and you know do the dishes nothing wrong with that it's just that i have not had to do it or it doesn't happen but if you in the united states it doesn't matter how affluent you are it's a habit that you know you get up and you start doing it you start helping your spouse hmm. so i think i i feel this whole challenge is about conditioning and what people project expectations out of you you mentioned something about a newly uh, uh, new bride coming into the family and negotiating is because there is a set pattern of expectation which has been created through social norms or society or whatever is the ecosystem that gets created and it could also subtly differ from community to community family to family uh, you know all, there is this even between what looks very similar there is there are so many layers of differences so when you said that women Actually, are yeah, i completely agree that ideological when you said women are manipulative it's not about manipulative they need to work the system to their advantage or they need to do it because in a obviously patriarchal society if they have to have their way yeah. you can call it manipulation you can call it being a psychologist to ensure that they get their uh, their part of whatever they want it may look very scheming or it may look very smart it depends on how you want to perceive it absolutely At end of the day i think so it's it's about how we want to look at things it can be looked at very negatively also but a loss for karna is a loss for him i, I would not uh, say that it's only about being happy about the fact that you know i have foster parents so why i mean i'm sure that that question will will be there at any point of time that why would my mother abandon me that's all and my mother if my father would abandon me i would still have the same question so i i don't think we can look too much at what would be more interesting is the fact what a woman like kunti would go through to abandon the child the challenges mentally that she may have faced the agony that she may have faced to do it the child of course grew up of course always with this question so i think it's about the ecosystem that we create the generation the beliefs that we have this is the place of women in society this is the place of men in society this is how we want to do things things like that and we look at it with those very norm narrow prism of what we have perhaps learned or experienced so at one point of time being in films was not considered uh, i mean women of low character were part of films and entertainment today it's an aspirational profession for lots of people hmm. it's the same thing it's the perspectives which have changed Yeah, no. The glamour absolutely. today. Mm-hmm. Wait, so, sorry, second. So I mean, today you see when you see reality shows on TV, t- kids are mm-hmm. pushing their parents are pushing yeah. them towards a profession and yeah. to do things which perhaps even less than 
half a century back would be considered immoral and I don't know what else. Right? So I, I would say it's about time and conditioning. How yeah. perspectives change. The same thing becomes different. Yeah, no, absolutely. I found myself completely agreeing with what you're saying that ideology plays a defining role. I mean, it's still fascinating how often love becomes hatred and hatred becomes love and how these two are really two sides of the same thing. Same and I believe one prime force behind it is possessiveness. See, it's very difficult. And this is probably what the spiritual lessons mm. try to teach us, how to love without wanting to possess something. But we human beings, it's very hard for us not to want to possess that what we love. And possession is a means of control. And whenever the object of our love or possession does refuses to be possessed, you know, that's when conflicts arise. I think most conflicts in family, most conflicts in intimate relationships are really about this need to possess. Now, the problem is, of course, the rules of possession are not applied in the same way to both genders. I think women are subjected to a different set of rules when it comes to being possessed in a patriarchal society. And I think, you know, there's no better text than the Mahabharata that how, you know, women's or women's yeah. bodies were repeatedly sort of gone through so many cycles of possession. And I think this is a, you know, question that really fascinated me with what happens with the male child. Since we've talked about the child, mother child relationship, you know, I think I realized with my novel, The Firebird, I realized I ended up showing how a male child slowly becomes a patriarch. So in, in this novel, when he's watching his mother act, he's initially full of pride that my mother is this wonderful actress. She's beautiful. People are. But then slowly he realizes that other people do not look at this with favor, that a woman who kisses other men on stage, the woman who sort of plays other lives on stage is not seen favorably. And slowly shame starts to corrupt him. That And then he realizes that what she's doing out there, that life she has there, she doesn't have it with me. I don't have a place in that life she has, her fictional life. And this is a classic instance of a, of a son wanting to possess a mother, which could be a perfectly innocent thing, you know. It's a, but that's where society comes in and corrupts the son and says that, oh, what your mother is doing is not right. You know, oh, which woman leaves at six in the evening dressed up, you know, put on makeup and fragrant and goes out. What kind of job is that? You know, there's only one kind of woman who leaves at this time. You know, everybody comes back home. And, you know, I think Rishabh also spoke about performance and women and performance. And so this is this is something I found is very disturbing that how something supposedly as pure as a mother-child relationship. I mean, and we see that in, in a different way in the Karno Kunti relationship. It's yeah. very intense. I mean, this is kind of why I realized I ended up naming my protagonist Ori, which actually means war. You know, so there is war. But of course, the name Ori, the full form is Ori Thro, which means yeah. somebody who sings once. Uh, sorry, Ori means enemy. I'm making a mistake. Ori is enemy. Uh, and Ori Thro is somebody who saves his own enemy, which again is very Mahabharata-like. I mean, in many ways, I realize Mahabharata is full of instances where you're asked to save your enemy and you become, because the friend-enemy divide is so thin. And in this case, I think the most explosive kind of love enmity that is there between a mother and a son, the most loaded relationship. And that's exactly where Coral is right by saying that Karno Kunti, that relationship, which, you know, beyond the Mahabharata, Rabindranath, made it immortal in the Bengali language, the Karno Kunti Shangbat, which captures the pathos of that entire relationship. And of course, the question of caste is inseparable here, that Karno had to find out who he is because of his caste situation. You know, he was not allowed to participate. He was not allowed to do the things. And um, But this is a perpetual thing, you know, affiliation, where we come from. You know, is our foster parents good enough, uh, especially if they are marginal? So these are questions which I'm sure Coral thinks a lot about. <laughs> Actually, I find so many correlation with present uh, things that happen in families and what used to happen, what, I mean, the way the things moved in the epics. I mean, simply uh, 
the children fighting and the mothers protecting sometimes speaking for all sometimes speaking only for their children you know these are things that have happened in a in the mahabharata in a lot more um, stronger way with arms but it's there somewhere and when i i mean when i refer to your firebird i just felt that there are so many instances where when i can see the mother as kunti who is a little detached of course attached but still there is something where i could relate this the kunti's working mother status to that of the working mother in firebird hmm. yeah. though you may so not I have had so that in your mind at all i think some themes are just there we don't think of them they are just always there you know it's yeah. just i think the sexual relationship between the son and the mother something which i think in india we don't want to talk about because it's so freudian and all that but there is this intimate bodily connection you know i mean it applies to both children of both sexes child child and the mother because the body is there and the slow loss of the mother's body you know is obviously what freudians talk about but yeah. i think with the son and i think it both ways even how the mother looks at the son and i know koral has a son so you know it's not hitting too close to home but there is that intimacy that intimacy is actually very unsettling you know the growing up there is a kind of a there is a kind of a there are some very strange moments i think one one feels that all the time sure. no i think uh, also because uh, despite the centuries of evolution i mean the core of the human being is still the same so when you, you the emotions that you feel and everything so whether we talk about mahabharat or you pick up that story and put it in today's context it still is there is a mother and there is a son there is a father and there is a i mean you know i mean whether it is kunti fighting for the empire of her sons and manipulating trying to do things or whether you look at a matriarch in a very large business family today i don't need to name mm-hmm. but you know we've had stories where two brothers are fighting and the mother steps in and you know creates this and mm-hmm. business empire and says this is yours this is yours how is it any different today where where they are as much a part of the process uh, you know uh, as uh, uh, something which we would see from mahabharat where the mother plays a matriarchal also role that you know that let's do this and this is how it happens or she decides uh, Oh, you you know you have this. Uh, you, all of you divide whatever you've got. The mother comes. Mm-hmm. I mean, the sons come to the mother and says, you know, we've got this thing, and you know, she says, uh, this is to be divided amongst all of you. I mean, whether it happened or it's folklore, but what I'm trying to say is, the concept is still the same. The central position of the mother or the woman in trying to determine to keep the family together to ensure that the best is there happening for the family. i think it's it's the same uh, reflection of the same stories happening again and again with a little bit of difference in shade and difference of uh, i mean color i think we are uh, almost running out of time we just five minutes to so, cycle any other questions you had for coral otherwise i'll also uh, want to ask her about how does this series progress what are we going to be looking at next and how much of course you mentioned draupadi and of course kunti will be there but having such strong female characters what are the shades which are different amongst all of them how do you conceptualize them and how do you see them uh rishab uh, what we have always pointed out and not just we the women everybody who is a little conscious points out is the entire game is that of the wom- the woman's uh, right to her choices her entitlement to her choices and i don't see feminism as uh, i mean i'm using the term i don't mean the term the way it exists today i don't believe in the term but okay let me rephrase it as uh, women's uh, movement movement forward progression so the way i see women's progression happening is about an equalization of that power ratio because uh, women's struggles is actually end of the day a power struggle 
some people felt that they are more powerful, they impose their powers on the others. It's as simple as that. And uh, we kind of thought about it a little too much, but actually it is ground level power struggle. So when it comes to the Sati series, what I'm trying to figure is uh, the voice through the voices, since the women have their own voices, I am trying to at least understand their choices. They have done a, they have done a lot of uh, unpopular things. They have made choices which were not very usual. Uh, there were frowns all around. There were questions all around. But they just took themselves forward. So writing this series gives me a uh, way to I and I won't say that I have got the right I, because I don't, but I definitely try to figure the agency of these women to uh, speak for themselves and talk about the choices that they have made, not necessarily defend them, but at least talk about the choices that they have made, which the world has responded to, and uh, at some times. We have criticized the choices. At some times, we didn't even get to know the choices. We just got to know the responses and criticized them, thinking that those are the, were the women's voices. This is something that Sati series is allowing me to do. And Draupadi will be a very different woman compared to Kunti. So while writing Kunti, I have, with all my heart, believed in Kunti. Now when I see Kunti from Draupadi's eyes, uh, I will see, uh, see a lot of things that I will not agree to or Draupadi will not agree to. Those will come up probably. And the same will happen with uh, Mandodari and Tara. And I feel that it's absolutely fine to not agree, but it's also equally uh, acceptable to hear that something is their choice. And... Uh, they have gone ahead with it without fearing about what will be the consequences, though they knew that there would be consequences. They have embraced them, sometimes even suffered them, but they have accepted them. Yeah. And based on the two books, I think uh, the voices are turning out to be already very different. I mean, Kunti came out is very different and, uh, you know, and striking. And Kunti's voice changes through the book, too. Um, my last question to you, Coral, is, um, you know, uh, and this is someone about someone who hasn't really explored mythical themes before. I mean, I try to dabble with it a little bit in a new book, but generally I haven't. The idea of what does it feel like to tell a story which everyone already knows? And um, so there are no surprises in a sense. And this was, of course, the normal way of storytelling in the pre-modern age. You know, Shakespeare told stories which everybody knew. Milton told stories which everybody knew. Homer told, even from Western culture. And certainly, obviously, with, with capitalism, with originality, with ind modern individual person, we kind of, oh, this is a bit, I must have an original story. So, and I think, um, you know, the whole question of suspense wasn't there when people wanted to watch a Greek tragedy or a Shakespeare play. They already knew the story. So there was no question of suspense. They went for something else. They went what, what people are doing with language, what people are doing. So in that sense, how do you feel when you are telling a story uh, which everybody knows, and not just that, a religious epic, which about which there's so much investment you know, in our culture. And, and to say nothing of the fact that a lot of people have also done this before. I mean, not what you're doing exactly, but creating different versions of the story. So how do you feel about this burden or challenge with you? I think, uh, Shalva, it's, it's very exhaustive. But uh, that is a journey I have consciously taken upon myself. <laughs> it's, it's exhaustive, but also uh, very, very uh, satisfy satisfying. Because mm. what I'm doing is a reinterpretation. I am not trying to put forward something blasphemous without a logic. I am holding on to the uh, to the points that have been given, and I am kind of you know, uh, or I am not debating from those points. I am moving from one point to the other, but trying to interpret what must have happened. Uh, the way they have been told uh, is one way, and they, it has left 
many chances, many opportunities for someone to read it in some other way. So that way, this storytelling is very interesting. Uh, also, there are many questions which I at times, you know, bang my head against. I mean, right now I am struggling to find the answer. Why did Mandodari love Raghun? I have no answer to that. And I am banging my head against it. That why would Mandodari uh, love Raghun? Similarly, in all of these, when it comes to uh, Draupadi, there is Indra is there in all of these uh, characters' lives, in the five women's lives. But in Draupadi, there is another uh, submarine which is which has been rushing towards me, and the name of that submarine is Krishna. So you know, uh, delving into these, I mean, uh, Draupadi is fire. Arjun is another fire. And then there is Krishna delving into these, trying to understand, or probably I should say, trying to re understand wherever they exist in terms of philosophy, in terms of literature, in terms of internalizing. And then you get to see a vast expanse which nobody had got into because uh, they didn't see it that way. It's as simple. So I feel ecstatic about it that these are some waters that I will jump into. Definitely Draupadi will be a very uh, interesting thing to do and also a very uh, scary thing to do because I know how people are attached to Draupadi. But uh, I'll do it nevertheless because I can see the waters and the waters are very inviting. More power to you. <laughs> fantastic. So I think, uh, I think that's a fantastic note to end this uh, uh, as uh, Saikat said more power to you uh, Koral this is amazing and I wish you all the best and thank you both uh, Koral and Saikat for joining us today it was really really something great and uh, Koral the questions you asked we could do another session like this and yet grapple with all the things you know so you left us with a lot of food of thought uh, so thank you very much. Uh, thank you, thank you so much. Uh, KLF for having us here and giving us this unique and wonderful platform to talk, interact and share so much. Uh, because uh, even if we had read the book, uh, there is so much more to the book, which uh, Oral and Sekas have shared just now about their respective books, which absolutely add another flavor and dimension to the whole book itself. So thanks a lot. And uh, thank you everyone for joining us uh, who are watching us now live as well as who will be catching up on the recording later. And have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you, Rishabh and Shaikat for joining. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. We'll see you later. Bye. Yes.